Uh, again, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, I, I give you a lot of credit. Uh, it's late in an afternoon to hear about ethics. It's kind of one of those things like philosophy or something. It seems like, you know, can you keep yourself awake, you know, late in the afternoon to hear the topic? Hopefully, hopefully we'll keep you awake. I do want to thank Sandy for the intro. And uh, we, we were just going to do some improv with these audience response system things. So uh, forgive us if we, if we have to coordinate on that just a little bit. We just have, we're just going to use that just a, just a little bit. Um, one of the things that, that helps me, I've got a couple of questions about, about all of you that we're going to use that for in just a minute. But I want to always start off these by asking a, a couple of fundamental questions just so I have a better idea kind of what your frame of reference is coming in to the presentation. So, how many of you in the audience, uh, just show of hands would be great, would consider yourselves uh, crooks? <laughs> All right, okay, how, how about this? How about, how about just kind of fundamentally dishonest? How many of you would consider yourself just fundamentally dishonest people? Uh, of course, if you were fundamentally dishonest, you probably wouldn't respond to it that way, right? Or how about just a little dishonest? Anybody, any little dishonest? Uh, well, okay, well, there's, you know, I give you credit. You were just trying to make me feel better just uh, so I wasn't completely shut out. So, um, you know, that's one of the interesting things about ethics and integrity is um, I don't think a lot of people, if you ask them that question, would, you know, would respond that, you know, that they really felt that way about themselves, um, that they felt they were, you know, dishonest or not doing the right. I mean, there were some, you know, flat out crooks who, know they're ripping people off and they've just decided to do that. I mean, those are, I think, hopefully those are the exceptions. But I think most people think they're kind of basically honest. Well, however, there does seem to, doesn't there seem to be a problem with people getting themselves into trouble? <laughs> I mean, how, how long can you go by and just even getting on the internet at all or reading any newspapers or what, watching anything on television? How many days could you go by without finding people who got themselves into trouble? I mean, I can't go by any day without finding someone who's gotten into trouble. And now, now of course, pretty soon, everybody's going to learn that's a problem, right? I mean, it can cost you your job, it can cost you your career, it can cost you your family, it can send you to jail, it could ruin you financially, it could embarrass you and your you know, family, worst thing, it might even embarrass your mother or your wife or your husband. I mean, they're, I mean, so people are going to figure that out and they're going to stop messing up, right? No, they never do. And actually, it's the same things over and over, you know. Uh, I mean, a while back, and I, and I just had to give up, I start, you know, I started doing these presentations. I started collecting newspaper stories about people getting themselves into trouble, to use as an example. All I can tell you is I, if I faithfully kept up with that task, I'd need a semi-truck to bring in the stories because it's just always there, and they seem to be you know, very repetitive. Um, I'll, give you a, I'll just give you a few more recent examples. So first of all, um, you know, I used to be in Mountain View. Carrie's from Mountain View. I was amazed she came to the presentation. Um, Google, a little company we have in Mountain View, and so I like to, you know, use Google a little bit. Now, what I did is I used Google on two terms. One was the term unethical, and one was the term corruption. That's a, that's, that's a fun word, isn't it? Corruption. I mean, that's like, that's a really icky word, you know, corruption. That's really bad. And I didn't just Google it for, if it, you know, where it is on the web. I Googled it from the perspective of just recent newspaper articles, okay? So I just went to Google News, and I don't know how far they go back, a few weeks or something. So not, not web references, but basically um, news story references. So yesterday I did this, and using the word unethical, in the last, I don't know, two, three weeks, there were 3,240 stories that had unethical in, the, in, in it in some fashion or another. So again, I would be having to carry around a much bigger folder than that if I kept collecting stuff. Uh, so that's a lot. That's a lot of examples uh, of, of that sort of thing. Now, corruption is a really, again, as I said, a really fearsome word. So, you know, I was hoping that would show up less. Well, actually, corruption has appeared in relatively recent news articles in the last few weeks 22,400 times. <laughs> 22,400 times. Now, wouldn't that be about the least 
enjoyable thing you would ever want is in the same sentence have your name and the, and the word corruption. That, would, that wouldn't be a good thing. You know, so part of what we're talking about this afternoon is how to avoid uh, newspaper articles or other sorts of you know, uh, uh, news stories or whatever where either corruption, unethical, dishonest, uh, you know, whatever appears and your name is in the same article in some fashion. So that's really, really the goal. Let me just, you know, just to show you the prevalence of the, of the challenge, because a lot, of people, a lot of people say, why do we need to talk about ethics? We're all honest. It's almost, um, you know, it's almost kind of negative to spend time talking. Don't people trust us? Don't, doesn't it, you know, we did an, an ethics initiative in Mount View. We wanted to make sure people didn't think we did that because we think the organization is unethical. It's just, you know, there are other reasons that you do that. Uh, it's, it's like preventative medicine in a way. Uh, but ethics is a good thing to kind of take for granted, not spend a lot of time thinking about, not spend a lot of time on it in your organization. Uh, but then all of a sudden, it's a really, a really huge issue. Um, again, just a few other examples of the prevalency in regard to it. I was at a meeting in, uh, down the Coachella Valley last week. So I said, well, I'm going to make this presentation next week. You know, I haven't looked for articles in a while, or at least I haven't been really thinking about it. Let's, let me pick the, the Desert Sun, their newspaper down there. And this is pretty good. On one page, I found three different stories about three different situations. One was about a, uh, a police officer in Southern California who decided it was a good idea to tip off a friend that the house he was at was going to be subject to a drug raid. And you know, so he's been fired, and now uh, he's up on charges. And then there was the police chief in Connecticut who stepped down you know, in the midst of his officers being accused of mistreating uh, Hispanics. Uh, and then you have, and this is really you know, brilliant, the, the, um, an executive, uh, I guess the ad admissions director or something, of Claremont McKenna College having to step down for inflating the SAT scores of, of, their, of the people they admit to the school. You know, it's, it, no, that's not just one page of one newspaper for one day. And then, you know, what a, you know, and it's not, you know, we're not just talking about government. We're not just talking about any particular field. It's, you know, first of all, is, is there any field that's exempt from these kinds of challenges? I mean, the clergy, here, here fraud charges ensnare ex-CEOs, um, leadership of a marching band in regard to hazing, uh, the terrible situation at Penn State, um, uh, China, you know, looks at his moral standards, uh, national ethics crisis seen after toddler's death. Um, hear about the Yale football coach who had to resign uh, in the last couple of months because he said he was a Rhodes Scholar when he wasn't, you know? And he's at Yale, you know? Um, it's, it's amazing. Schools flunked inquiries into suspicious scores. Uh, now, it seems like football is having a tough time. The Ohio State football coach, Jim Tressel, you know, not following up on things involving his players. Here's a police chief in a small town in Northern California. Tell me if this, was, this one is not good judgment. Um, saying she used very poor judgment, the embattled police chief da -da -da -da, issued a statement today admitting that she took $1,300 from the canine fundraising, uh, of, of canine fundraising monies to buy a horse. You know, her own personal horse. She only borrowed it for a few days, but no, I guess it sounded like a good idea at the time, but it didn't turn out that good way. And, and again, more Penn State stuff, Syracuse, you name it. Uh, it's all kinds of different, different sorts of things. So let's go ahead and try the system. And uh, do I need to advance it, Sandy? Yes. All right. There we go. Uh, th th these are not tough questions, but this is just a you prove you're still awake. That's the main reason I'm going to ask you to respond to these things. I, I am curious uh, on whether you lead a team or not. All right, so about, about okay, that worked. You know, that was pretty cool. That wasn't a hard question, was it? 
Well, the bottom line is what, what we're going to talk about this afternoon fully applies whether you lead a team or you don't lead a team. But for those, you know, about 45 percent of you who do lead a team, it gets a little bit more complicated because uh, you have a greater response. All of you have a responsibility not only for yourself but for other people. But those of you who lead a team, it kind of it kind of multiplies a little bit more. But cool, it worked. All right, we have one more question at the front end, right, Sandy? All right. So uh, I, I would say on, on, now can they pick more than one? No. Okay, so pick the one that's the most recent. If you, uh, if you it, let's say if you've had it within six months, hit six months rather than a year or five years. Wow, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, the 6% of you who've, who've, who've never have, you either you're very lucky and fortunate or you, you really need to be at this class, one or the other. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's interesting. That's a, that's a lot of challenge. And so that was worth asking. Good, good. All right, do I have control again? All right. Um, the thing about ethics is, it's prevalent, and it's a uh, it's it's a challenge. But we take it for granted. It seems like that, you know, talking about ethics in your organization, working on it, gets often gets pushed aside by well, we got to balance the budget, we got to do these inspections, we got to do this, we got to do that, and it's almost like taking it for granted. Which I my one of my major propositions for you this afternoon is taking it for granted it is about the biggest mistake you and your organization can do. Because in my view, when there is an ethical lapse, even if it's only one person out of an organization of a thousand, when there is an ethical lapse, there's not much worse that can happen to an organization. Would you agree with me on that? Because the public and, and other people, you know, they know organizations do make mistakes from time to time. They realize that organizations may not always do things the way they would like to have them done from time to time. But when there is a, an actual ethical lapse, an, an ethical mistake, uh, a scandal of some sort, I think that has a huge impact on you and your organization, on morale and, and everything else. So when there is an ethical lapse, there's nothing more important, frankly, than to do whatever needs to be done to recover from it. But it's often too little, too late, and you're very much in a reactive, uh, responsive kind of mode, and it's often hard to dig yourself out of a hole. So one of my propositions is to encourage you and the organizations you work for just to spend a little bit of time on ethics before you have a problem. I'm not going to suggest that anything you do is going to be any kind of guarantee that you're not going to have a problem, but it does increase your odds that you're going to be able to avoid a problem or at least better respond to it if you do end up having a problem. So in the, you know, probably the number one theme is don't take ethics for granted. So let's, let's go on through these slides a little bit. I would encourage you to um, you know, ask any questions at any point. Um, and I'll repeat the question since we're, we're recording, uh, but I'd be happy to do that. I'd really rather not have this be a, a, a monologue. So if you have some questions on any of the slides, please ask them. Also, would, would anybody be concerned if we finished before 5 o'clock? Would that be a problem for you? Uh, I don't want to disappoint you. You know, I know you paid to come to this conference, so I just want to you know, make sure that wouldn't be a problem. All right. These are 15 thoughts I've developed, and I've made these presentations to a number of organizations and a lot of city manager and county manager folks and whatever. Um, and uh, again, uh, hopefully you'll get something from them. Prevention first. Kind of what I just spoke about was, you know, you can't always prevent things from happening, uh, but if you don't do any sort of preventative work, you don't, you know, it's kind of like having a physical exam every once in a while versus never. I mean, if you don't, if you don't do something to try to increase your odds, you could more likely have a problem. So. Um, Again, we and our organizations 
really want to think we're all ethical and we're, you know, we, we do things for the right reasons in the right way. But if you ever get too, uh, too self-confident, if you ever get uh, too cocky about the issue, uh, and you take ethics and integrity for granted, you're setting yourself up for a fall. If it's, if it's something that is, yeah, we don't have to deal with it, we're all good people. So don't take it for granted. One of the things that I think is really important is to figure out a way periodically, not every day, but periodically to have a conversation about it, uh, to talk about what it means in your organization, to talk about uh, examples of, when, of how you might be challenged in regard to ethics and integrity, and to talk about how you respond to those challenges. It's much, uh, it's much easier to respond to a challenge. And you know, how many of you folks do inspections? Yeah, you get lots of challenges <laughs> and lots of judgment calls, right? Uh, you, know, that, you know, that can be a, th a tough situation. And if you don't think about in advance how you're going to react to a particular situation, how you're going to respond to a particular circumstance, uh, you, can, you can run into some real difficult situations. So talking about it, discussing scenarios, that can be very helpful. Uh, train, you know, thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, there are lots of different ways you can train. You can, you can you know, read materials. You can, uh, there's some excellent books on the topic. Um, but again, I think, uh, you know, looking at different ways to, to deal with it is, I think, important. And again, uh, don't fall into the trap, as I said earlier, of we're all ethical, we're all good people, we're always going to do the right thing. Um, don't assume that without any kind of preventative work, without any kind of preparation, it's going to, it's going to happen. Um, one of the things that's also, uh, and I, I may have be covering it later in the, in the afternoon, but one of the other things to consider is, as I said, no matter what you do, if you have a big enough organization with enough people making judgments and even good people make bad decisions and good people run into, run into some problems, uh, but even if, if that is all the case and you still have something that comes up, uh, what, what, are the, what is the press or the public going to be likely to ask you uh, about, about the situation? Uh, they're going to want to know the details of who did what, when, and who knew what, et cetera, et cetera, as we'll talk about. But one thing they're going to do is, did you do anything to try to prevent this from happening? And if you've never done any training, you've never talked about it, you don't have a code of ethics, uh, you, you, you know, you've never, never done any preventative work, and that's, that's a much harder conversation to have. Uh, and it's, it's, it's much better to say, yeah, this is a terrible situation, this person did such and such, whatever, whatever. But we tried to avoid it. You know, we, we tried to do this and we tried to do that. So uh, I would encourage you to you know, try to be advocates to go back and if there isn't some preventative work going on in your organization, figure out a way for you to do that. And again, um, you know, culture and values are the most powerful ingredients of an organization. And people can step into an organization their first few days on the job and they get a pretty good idea of what the organization's about, what's acceptable and what isn't, what's reasonable and what isn't. And uh, whatever you can all do to affect that organizational culture um, in various kinds of ways, and I'll give some examples of that later, I think is going to be important. Anything, any questions on the prevention part? All right. Yeah, this is, sounds pretty simple, um, but, you know, uh, I, I think it goes without saying that, that you know, by the time the people are ready to be employed, while people can change and, and people can adjust to the expectations of, of an organization, you have a much easier task if you hire people who believe in ethical conduct uh, and integrity. Uh, there's some folks, for whatever reasons, uh, have more difficulty understanding that concept and getting that concept. So again, it's very difficult to have an ethical organization without eth ethical employees. Um, you need to think about it in, as part of the hiring process. Um, that doesn't mean you only use, use that as, a, as, a, as the only criteria, but um, have any of you been through a hiring process, maybe one where you've been selecting someone or where, you, where you've been a candidate where nothing has been brought up about ethics or integrity or your values. It just hasn't been, just wasn't a, wasn't a question. I think that's pretty common, frankly. I mean, you focus on, hopefully you focus on the technical skills, the interpersonal skills, the writing skills, whatever. Um, but 
you know, if you never consider the person you're hiring, you know, what are their values and what is their perspective on ethics and integrity, that's, that's a tough situation. Uh, if it's not a criteria and if it doesn't seem to be uh, a criteria in the process, that in and of itself communicates a message to who you're hiring of whether it's important to your organization or not. Um, talk about it as part of, the, uh, part of the selection process. That doesn't mean you know, most of the selection process is about that, but it really doesn't take that much time and usually what they call a situational question is, is really the best way to probe that topic where you ask somebody how they would respond to a particular situation and maybe they have exactly the right answer or maybe not. Uh, okay, you go in and you're inspecting so-and-so place and uh, so-and-so thinks you're, the, you know, you're their really good buddy and they offer you some discounted tickets to the whatever, whatever. Uh, just think, you're just hearing the thought process the person goes through in regard to how they would analyze the situation and how they would respond to it. Uh, can be very meaningful and just fitting one of those into an interview process can make a, a big difference and can tell you, um, again, it doesn't mean somebody has to get it absolutely correct, but it, it'll tell you whether, you know, they thought about it, whether those kinds of things are, are important to them or not. Uh, and background checks. Yeah, background checks, I've heard lots of people say that background checks are more difficult than they used to be. They are. But my experience as a city manager was you could, you could still get people to provide you a lot of information if you're willing to ask and go through the process. And uh, if you don't ask uh, and you don't at least try, maybe some people just say, oh, I can tell you they've been employed here from X date to X date. But you might be surprised sometimes what you can find out. So again, my preposition is there are very few things that are worse to an organization's reputation and worse to our personal reputations than a, uh, a, an ethical misstep, whether a small one or a large one. And one big way to try to address that question is to deal with the hiring process and at least have a little tiny bit of that hiring process uh, address that question. Anything about that slide that you have any, any thoughts about? All right. All right. Um, one of my favorite, or least favorite, I'm not sure, uh, things I hear is, is when someone gets themselves into trouble uh, ethically uh, or whatever. You ever hear any, and I hate to say I don't want to pick on politicians because it would be hard to have a democracy without politicians, but have you ever heard anybody trying to defend their conduct as saying, well, I didn't break the law. There's no laws that I broke, right? Well, the, the, I think that's a pretty weak defense because if you're going to be a public official, whether you're going to be the, the employee of a public agency or you're going to be the mayor or senator or president or whatever, uh, I know the public, certainly the press, and hopefully yourselves hold yourself to a higher standard of not breaking the law, okay? So what, what my preposition is here is basically don't confuse legal with ethical. They're two different things. Um, you can be very unethical and keep yourself out of jail, but that doesn't mean you're going to be an example for everyone to follow. That doesn't mean you're going to be meeting the expectations of the taxpayers or of the press or the voters or the citizens or the people that you regulate. Um, so if you ever find yourself saying, geez, should I do this or should I not do that? And you find yourself coming to the point of, well, it's legal for me to do that. Well, stop right there and really think about it because that's not, you know, in my view, that's not good enough. And the higher you will reach in your organization, the less that is good enough, okay? So, again, next time, uh, next time you hear someone get up and they've been caught doing something bad and they say, um, well, I didn't break any laws. Just think of our session here a little bit. Have a little smile on your face, say, okay, fine. So they didn't break any laws, but they probably screwed up pretty badly, but you know, they can't go to jail over it. Just, just think about that a little bit. Yeah, that's basically you know, a little bit more of that. It's not, not gonna make you a role model and certainly is not gonna be considered as being consistent with the, the spirit and the, and the letter of the law, depending on what you do. Uh, we all work for public agencies, I imagine, or the vast majority of us work for public agencies. Um, I mean, I, I think that really is special. 
I mean, there are challenges with it. There's certainly challenges in this day and age. Of course, there's, there's financial challenges in both the public and the private sector, but lots of things about compensation and pensions and budget reductions and folks not liking government and whatever, whatever. But I loved the 40 years I served in, boy, that's scary to say that, 40 years. I love the time I spent in, uh, in government, and there were some good times and there were some tougher times. Uh, but I really did, do think it's a, uh, it's a real public trust, and we need to hold ourselves to a pretty high standard. And, you know, if we can conv you know, convince by our conduct most of the people, not everybody, some people will just don't like public employees or whatever, but most of the people, most of the time, the way we conduct ourselves, we can maintain that public tr trust. I think that's very important. But it does mean exceeding any kind of legal standard and going on and really reflecting on what is ethical and what uh, would cause you to be viewed as someone with integrity. All right, you promised to listen to, you know, next time, I think about that next time you hear somebody on TV says they, were, they didn't break the law, right? Uh, yeah.